Hi, this is 2020 Church and I'm Pastor Larry Enriquez. You know, I'm glad to be here with you on this evening and if it's in any other time of the day for you, um, I'm glad you're here listening in. You know, I've been working through the Old Testament and seeing the gospel story in the Old Testament because again, the gospel when it comes upon us in what we call the New Testament, it isn't brand new. All along, God has been working in that, that character of grace to bring us to this place where we are saved by grace through Jesus Christ and our faith in him. And we find that working out in the Old Testament as it comes to the New Testament and reveals it in the fullness of Jesus Christ. But as we've gone through the Old Testament, we've more recently gone through the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, we have this very, very difficult phase, uh, uh, years in the history of the Jews. And then we come to the book of Ruth, and that still is in the time of the Judges. And we taught that, I at least talked about that last week. And now we come to the books of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. The first and seconds of those are a little bit mis misunderstood. If you think they're two different books, they're really just one book, but it's cut up into two. Probably because of its length, I'm not sure why. But but you have First and Second Samuel is really you know one book, uh, and First and Second Kings is really you know, one book of Kings. So I say that because in, in the book of First Samuel, it's still in the time period of the judges. In fact, Samuel is the last of the judges. And when we read First Samuel, the book of First Samuel, the first seven chapters of the book of First Samuel are really, is really the life of Samuel. And then from First Samuel chapter, I believe it's eight, and to the end, which I think there's 30 some chapters, is really the the life and the, the kingship of the first king of Israel, which is King Saul. So that's first Samuel. And then second Samuel is is the life of King David. So it's not hard to look at that book and all that stuff, but how what's the how did we see the gospel in light of the story of the gospel in First and Second Samuel. So that's kind of like what we're going to point at here as we look at the word today. Now, it's very interesting, but I love that I'm doing this for my own personal selfishness because it gets me back into all of the scriptures and the story, the consistent story of the scriptures of the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, I said it before that I always had a difficult time reading the Bible in the year because the way those are usually set up, we're reading some of the Old Testament, some of the New Testament, and something of the of the um, what we would call the Psalms or the Proverbs or Ecclesiastes or some of the poetic books, and and it didn't flow for me. It was difficult to see the 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 flow of the scriptures when you just read parts like that. So I like going through. Uh, the books of the Bible because you see the fullness of it and the wholeness of it. So we're here. Let me say this, that the last line in the book of Judges, as you might remember, is that they did what was right in their own eyes. That is the people of Israel. And that was just disastrous. They didn't follow God. And in their sin, in their depravity, God would, would bring a, a force against them to discipline them and to reveal to them the outcome of a life without God, without him. And then he would raise up a judge who would be a, a military and a spiritual deliverer in them. And all those judges were, were flawed, some better than others, but they all had great flaws. Some had great flaws. And so we come to the book of Ruth, and in that same time period, we have that story that I've already mentioned. Then we come to 1 Samuel, and here's what we read. If you were going to read the book of 1 Samuel, here's what you'd read in verse 1 and 2. And maybe you've read it. I hope you have. You need to be reading through these books. I hope that you have. But here's what it says. 
Now there was a certain man from Ramathium Zufim, in the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the second was Penina. Now, Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, you would read that and go, do I want to read this book? These names are kind of crazy. He's got two wives, and that's already craziness. And the second wife has the children, and the first one does not. And so there's there's this discord in the family. All this is the start of 1 Samuel. Now, what happens is that Hannah prays to the Lord, and she, she ends up conceiving and, and having a, a baby in whom she delights in, in God because of the baby, and so gives the child to the priesthood to be raised by the priest. And that's kind of the start of 1 Samuel. So the first seven chapters of 1 Samuel is, is again, about this judge prophet named Samuel. And he comes into a scene that is very difficult because Eli and his sons are just wayward. And in fact, because of their waywardness, there'll be further destruction in Israel. And in fact, the Ark of the Covenant will, will be taken from Israel by the Philistines and housed with them for a while until Again, there's things that happen because of the Philistines housing the Ark of the Covenant. Destruction comes upon them. So without getting into all of that, we find that Samuel is this character who is really the character that is going to bring Israel to a place of their need to be, there needs to be a king, a leader. But the people of Israel are demanding leadership that is from their perspective, a leader. So we find King Saul. In fact, the Bible speaks of him as being from shoulders and head up, taller than all the rest, and the best looking guy in Israel. Well, that didn't pan out very good. And we have in the book of First Samuel, from eight on or seven on, the life of Samuel. Now, Many have made reference to this, but it's important that I make it too because it's just true. We're all flawed and all the kings of Israel are flawed. But we find that Saul, the first king of Israel, is flawed because he's unrepentant. He's, unre he, he's unrepenting in his in his soul so that when he when he acts out his flaws and he's he's called on it he only repents in the way that that those without god repent in other words they're just really sad and sorrowful that the consequence of their poor actions are being visited upon by the gravity of sin and the actions of God. And so he's sorrowful because what he did brought bad consequences, not because what he did was against God and against humanity and against a heart that is wayward. And he doesn't find real repentance there. The difference between him and David is that David, as flawed as he is, is a real repentive soul. He's real sorrowful before God many times over and over again. In fact, David is quite aware in due time of his failings. David failed as a king many times. He failed as a man. He failed as a friend. He failed as a father. But we find true repentance in his life. And that's really the gospel that we're saved by grace through faith in God who imputes to us his righteousness. But what it takes from our end of it 
is repentance. Grace comes to those who don't deserve it. But those who recognize their need, it comes to those who recognize how far they are from God in their inner beings. And it comes from their willingness to say no to that and yes to God. It's called repentance. We have that in David. So we find that narrative of the gospel already there in the book of First and Second Samuel. Now, if I can, I want to go back just a little bit and read here out of First Samuel uh, chapter 4, 14 through 18, to just get a sense of the time of the period of season of Israel's existence. When Eli heard the noise of the crying, that Eli is the priest who Samuel the prophet is, is under. He's crying because he hears the sorrow of Israel as they've been visited upon, visited upon by the hand of God through its enemies because they are so sinful. And it says, and the man hurriedly came and told Eli. There's a lot, of course, I'm not reading, but again, just to get a sense of this time. Now, Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see. The man said to Eli, I am he that came out of the army and I fled today out of the battle line. And he said, what is the word, my son? The messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines and there also has been a great slaughter among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead and the ark of the of God is taken that's the consequence of of uh, of leadership that has failed to follow Yahweh to the extent that there's great damage and ripple effect of their sins upon others isn't that the nature of all of our sins i know me and the many times that i've sinned that it doesn't just affect me, but those who I love with all my heart. So one of the, one of the, I would say, motors uh, in my soul to not sin is that I don't want to hurt those I love. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, we find here in the people of Israel a very wayward leadership in the priesthood itself so he's so taken back by what's happened that he falls back and he breaks his neck and he dies and the philistines take the ark of god that's the time period of first samuel and the fact that they need leadership now it's not that they need leadership that's the problem it's how they want leadership they want it the way that they want it not the way that god wants it and so they end up picking Saul, as I said earlier. And so Saul becomes the king who, again, is setting up for God's king that will come, which is King David in 2 Samuel. And so we find here in 2 Samuel chapter 7, a little, a little again, message or snippet from Second Samuel that gives us, a, gives us a sense of what's going on in the big picture. Here's what it says. Then David went into the tabernacle and sat before the Lord and prayed, O Lord God, why have you sh showered your blessings on such an insignificant person as I am? You hear the voice of David as flawed as he is and as flawed as he will be. He has a real heart for God and understands his predicament as a human being. He understands his illness, his DNA of sin. And he has an attitude that Saul never had. Now, this is important because the gospel demands 
that we come to grips with the reality of our predicament without God, that we need saving. See, the gospel is that Jesus came to save, but if you don't think you need saving, if you're so prideful that you can't admit how you need saving, then you'll never know God and his grace. And we hear it right here from the voice of King David, who is the best king that Israel ever had, but yet we'll find that he is not the king who ultimately will deliver them. So I'm, in fact, reading from 2 Samuel chapter, chapter 7, where it says that as, re, as, as real and genuine as David is, as, as alive he is to, to God's undeserved love for him, he understands he's not the deliverer, but that he's yet to come. Again, it's pointing towards the greater gospel, the one that's going to come, the true king, is in David. It's Jesus. So here's what David says. Oh, Lord God, why have you answered? I'm, I'm sorry. Why have you showered your blessing on such an insignificant person as I am? And now, in addition to everything else, you speak of giving me an eternal dynasty. Oh, Lord God, what can I say? For you know what I am like. You are doing all these things just because you promised and because you want to. <laughs> that really is a wonderful translation of the gospel in the Old Testament. It's about grace because God has picked David because God is shouting with blessing. You know, you've come to Jesus because Jesus loves you and drew you to himself. In the mystery of God's plan, in God's heart and mind, God is drawing you to himself. And maybe you're hearing this and, and maybe you've gone through a spell where you feel like you're, you're not worthy. Where there are recurring things in your mind or in your heart or in your actions that tell you that you're not good enough. Well, let me say that you aren't and never were. But God loves you deeply and died for you and has picked you out to be his. And that's your worth. That's your value. That God has picked you to be his. See, God has given you a new destiny and a new identity. That's why we're called aliens and strangers here. Because when you belong to Jesus, you belong to him and your home is somewhere else. So... It goes on to say, such generosity, David says, David says, is far beyond any human standard. Oh, Lord God, what can I say? For you know what I am like. In verse 21, you are doing all these things just because you promised to and because you want to. How great you are, Lord God. We have never heard of any other God like you, and there is no other God. What a statement of the gospel. Every other God is demanding some work, something that proves that, that, that they are able because they sacrifice enough. In many cases, because they sacrifice their children or they sacrifice precious things to them. Now, I do believe that for us to follow Jesus demands sacrifice of our lives, but not the death of it the giving away of it, that we would know the abundant life. He was a God who's saying, no, just come to me in repentance. Come to me and let, him, and let me lead your life because I am the one and only true God. And there's nothing you can do to earn it, nothing you can do to deserve it. What other nation in all the earth has received such blessings as Israel, your people? For you have rescued your chosen nation in order to bring glory to your name. You know, God has chosen you and you're a part now of that, not the Israeli chosen nation, but of God's holy nation, royal priesthood, uh, uh, for, uh, it tells us in Peter. You are part of God's nation, God's royal priesthood. You have been chosen to be his. Here's the gospel in First and Second Samuel. And now, Lord God, 
do as you have promised concerning me and my family. And may you be eternally honored when you have established Israel as your people and have established my dynasty before you. For you have revealed to me, O Lord of heaven and God of Israel, that I am the first of a dynasty which will rule your people forever. That is why I have been bold enough to pray this prayer of acceptance. For you are indeed God and your words are truth. And you have promised me these good things. So do as you have promised. Bless me and my family forever. May our dynasty continue on and on before you, for you, Lord God, have promised it. See, the real promise is that David isn't the king that saves us all. No, he's in the lineage of the king that's to come, which is King Jesus. He's coming to deliver us to eternity forever and ever. You see, the book of Judges and Ruth and the first part of Samuel and really all the Bible exclaims to us that we need a savior, that we need a redeemer. And over and over again, the Bible is revealing that reality, that a savior and a redeemer is coming. Here's an interesting story to kind of maybe end with in light of the gospel in First and Second Samuel. There's a story in 2 Samuel regarding King David. King David is head and shoulders above everybody else, not in his height or in his handsomeness as a man, but in his love for God and in his faith in God. So that when the Philistine giant Goliath is is taunting the Israeli army. King David, just a shepherd boy, comes out and, and he goes out. And he says, you have your armor and all the stuff that you have. I have but a sling in this stone, but I go out in the name of my God. And he goes out in the name of Yahweh. In the name of God. He slays. He just slays the giant. And, and here's the reality of that story. When he goes out as one man and slays the giant, then something happens to him that happens to all the rest of Israel. When he slays the giant, he's now free from the oppression of the Philistines. They flee the God of Israel represented in King David because of what David did by faith. Now, here's, here's what happened. Did the whole army defeat the Philistines? Did the whole army defeat Goliath? No, only David did. And his redemption, so to speak, was imputed to all of Israel. One man came freedom to all of them. That's pointing to the gospel. Only by Christ is the righteousness of God imputed to us. Not because we all did something that deserves it. Only Jesus did something that deserved it. And he gave that to all of us. So we can read this in 1 Corinthians 1.30. For it is from God alone that you have your life through Christ Jesus. He showed us God's plan of salvation. He was the one who made us acceptable to God. He made us pure and holy and gave himself to purchase our salvation. That's saying this, that the righteousness of God, the salvation of God, the freedom of God, the righteousness of Jesus was imputed to us by faith. Just like the freedom that came to Israel was imputed to them by one act of King David. He's like an image, a little flawed image of the perfect king that was to come. And 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. We have that picture throughout the scriptures and certainly we have it in First 
in particular in 2 Samuel regarding King David. The righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of Christ was imputed to us. Like the victory of King David was imputed to that army and to those people. May we know this God of grace, this God of redemption, and find the greatest joy in what we've been called now, sons and daughters of God. May we continue to live out our lives in true repentance and in true genuine love for this God who loves us freely. And may we know that grace and live in it. May we stand in it. Well, God bless you. May you go in peace. And I hope to see you this Sunday at church. The Lord bless you. Stay connected to the body of Christ. Stay connected to the Word of God and grow unto Him, our King, our Redeemer. God bless you. Go in peace.